الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بالسنة لوم الدين All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic of this evening's presentation in the shade of the throne is a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he said سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ Seven will be shaded by Allah Almighty on a day when there will be no other shade besides His shade. إِمَامٌ عَادِلٌ وَشَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي عِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ a just ruler, a youth who grows up worshipping Allah, a man whose heart is attached to the mosques. وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّا فِي اللَّهِ اجْتَمَعَا عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَا عَلَيْهِ وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ امْرَأَةٌ ذَاتَ مَنْصِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالْ إِنِّي أَخَافَ اللَّهِ Two men who love each other for the sake of Allah, they meet on the basis of it and separate on the basis of it. A man who is invited by a woman of high position and beauty, and he replies, Indeed, I fear Allah. وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَةٍ فَأَخْفَاهَا حَتَّى لَا تَعَلَمُ شِمَالُهُ مَا تُنْفِقُ يَمِينُهُ وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهِ خَالِيًا فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَاهِ A man who gives charity and hides it so much so that his left hand is unaware of what his right hand gave. And a man who remembers Allah in private and his eyes become filled with tears. The hadith describes seven categories of people. And these categories are all linked by common factors. Among them is the love and the fear of Allah and the desire to hide one's acts of righteousness from people. They are linked together also with regards to how each one is a product of another. That the Imam who is Adil, the righteous ruler, he, when he establishes a, a, an, an environment of righteousness, then young people will grow up worshipping Allah. And those who grow up worshipping Allah will be attached to the mosques. And those who are attached to the mosques, they will develop amongst themselves a love for each other for the sake of Allah. And if they are called by a woman who is beautiful and has money and she calls them to corruption, they will have the strength of character and faith to reject her saying, indeed, we fear Allah. And those who are, have reached this level of fear of Allah, when they do righteous deeds, they do them not seeking the admiration and the praise of others. So they willingly give charity without anyone knowing who gave that charity. And furthermore, such a person or such people with these char characteristics they indeed will worship Allah privately, remember Allah, and their eyes will become filled with tears. Now when we look at the hadith, the hadith seems to refer to men. A just ruler, the term used here is imamun adil, a just male ruler. 
And then a youth, a male youth who grows up worshipping Allah and so on and so forth. The term man or the male terms are used throughout the hadith. However, the reality is that hadiths of this nature, as verses of the Quran which address similar issues, they are not restricted to men, but include females at the same time. And this is a basic factor which is found in the Arabic language in that we commonly will use male terms to address females. So it is only where the term has aspects which are only applicable to males that it is restricted to males. But in general the hadith addresses both males and females. Furthermore, the number seven, though the Prophet ﷺ began saying, Sab'atun yudhilluhumu Allahu ta'ala fi dhillih, yawma la dhilla illa dhilluh, that there are seven who will be in the shade of Allah, most great, most high, on a day when there will be no other shade. The reality is that that number has no special significance. We can find many references to sevens mentioned in the Quran, whether it's seven times tawaf around the Kaaba or between Safa and Marwa. When a child reaches the age of seven, you know, he should be taught salah or she should be taught salah, and so on and so forth. There are many mentions of seven. Sometimes those seven has, have specific re uh, relevance to that particular circumstance. Other times it's just a number which is mentioned. And we know that in fact this is just a number because of the fact that there are other narrations like one by Abu Bashir in which he says, he mentions from the Prophet Muhammad that whoever gives time to a debtor, whoever gives time, gives time to a person in debt, they owe us money and we give them time to pay. The time has come up and they can't pay but we give them a chance to pay in spite of the time that the fact that they can't pay whoever does that when the debtor is in difficulty or has excuses or excuses that person altogether and cancels off his debt these two people will be shaded by Allah in his shade on the day when there will be no shade except his this hadith is also found in Sahih Muslim so here are two other categories mentioned which were not in the seven mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So from that, you know, scholars have concluded that the number seven is not of particular significance here. Furthermore, you have uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. He found another ten cases uh, in authentic narrations which are also of, of categories of people also included in the uh, shade of Allah's throne. Now, the hadith goes on to say, seven who are shaded by Allah Almighty in His shade, fi dhilli, shaded in Allah's shade. This, for some people, became a problem. Does Allah have a shade? Is to have, if Allah has a shade, then it is making him like his creatures. To get shade, you have to have light on one side, and you're in between that light, and you get a shade. So this became an issue. However, what we understand is that there are other narrations of this hadith in which Allah clarifies, as in the had narration of Salman, that it was not in Allah's shade, but fi dhilli arshi, in the th shade of his throne. So, what we're talking about is that time which my brother introduced. On the day of judgment, when people will be standing before Allah, they have been resurrected, the earth becomes flat, and they're all standing, and Allah will bring the sun close. The sun will become so close that it will be described as being only a mile away. 
And this is the source of the heat. And at that point, the heat becomes so intense that everybody is sweating, and they're sweating according to their deeds. Those who have a lot of good deeds, then the sweat will only go up to their ankles. Those whose deeds are, are less, it will go up to their knees or to their waist. Those who de his evil deeds are many, they will be drowning in their sweat. This will be a day when everyone will desire the shade of Allah's throne. But still, the concept of the shade of Allah's throne, for those who have difficulty accepting how Allah has described Himself and the things which belong to Him, they explain that the throne of Allah is His dominion, His authority, and His rule. Groups like the Mu'tazilites and the Kharijites and the Ash'aris, these people explain the way Allah's throne, saying, no, Allah does not have a throne. What he is referring to here is his dominion. However, those on the correct path, who didn't deviate from the way that Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah was understood by the messenger, by his companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them, those who stayed on that path, they maintain that Allah has a throne, as he said. However, they avoided getting into how is his throne, in explaining how his throne is. It is enough for us to know, as the Prophet ﷺ explained, that the footstool, the kursi, mistakenly translated as the throne also, in Ayatul Kursi, the Kursi, if we compare the whole of this universe, everything created, to the Kursi, it is like a brass ring thrown in the middle of the desert. And the Kursi, in relationship to the Arsh, to the throne, is like that same brass ring thrown in the middle of a desert. So the whole of creation in relationship to the kursi is insignificant, a brass ring in a desert. And the kursi in relationship to Allah's throne is also like a brass ring in a desert. So what are we? What is this creation like in relationship to Allah's throne? Virtually nothing. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira in Sahih al-Bukhari said, if you ask Allah, ask him for Firdaus, as it is, it is the middle and the highest point of paradise from which the rivers of paradise spring forth. And above it is the throne of the most merciful. Now if we take as the as those rationalists would have us take, that the throne of Allah is His dominion. Are we saying that Allah's dominion is above paradise? I mean, this is the position of His dominion? Or if we take the verse from Surah Hud, verse 7, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ Allah's throne is above the water. We'll say his dominion is above the water. Or worse, in Surah Al-Haqqah, verse 17, when Allah says there, وَيَحْمِلُ عَرْشَ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ ثَمَانِيَةٍ And on that day, Allah's, the throne of your Lord, will be borne by eight, eight angels. Are we saying, that Allah's dominion will be carried by eight angels on the day. So we can see that this idea of explaining away Allah's throne as His dominion is clearly in error. It is clearly in error. It is the throne of Allah. Now, 
in the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad goes on to describe those who are shaded by the throne. The first is the Imam Adil, the righteous and just Imam. One who is just in himself and in his rule. His justice is not for show or to establish uh, relationships with others with ulterior motives. His justice is a justice based fundamentally on his fear of Allah. He treats all justly. He, he repels oppression. All before him are equal. And he implements Allah's laws on all of the creation over which he has authority. As I said, his justice is from within. It is not justice as a facade externally in order to gain certain uh, positions or control or power or wealth in this life. Now, this position of being the Imam Adil, the ultimate ruler of the Muslim state, who is just, of course, this does not include women, because Prophet Muhammad had said that a people who make a woman their ruler will not succeed. So we know in this case, in this category, the head of state, women are excluded. However, Prophet Muhammad said, Kullukum ra'in, each and every one of you is like a shepherd responsible for his flock. So each one does play the role of being, being an imam. He's a leader who has people who follows him or her. She in her home is in charge of the home and those under her uh, authority. So the issue of being just is still valid in her case in this regard. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he narrated from the Prophet Muhammad that he said, the just people will be on podiums of light to the right of Ar-Rahman, of the most merciful Allah. And both his hands are right. وَكِلْتَ يَدَيْهِ yamina. Those who are just in their rulings and their families and in what they have been put in authority over. This is in Sahih Muslim. That those who are just in the rulings that they make, in their positions of authority, whether it be within their families or outside of their families, they will be put in a special position on the Day of Judgment, on podiums of light. Besides being under the shade of Allah's throne, following the judgment, they will be on podiums of light on the right of Ar-Rahman. A special case. Why? Because of the fact that the Imam, the ruler, the authority, has no fear of anyone, any human being, because of which he or she will do the right thing, will judge justly. They are in a position which is easily exploited, which is easily abused. It is very easy when a person is in, the, in that upper level, at the top of an organization, or at the top of the state, or at the top of the family, to abuse their position of authority and power. It is very easy, because they are not accountable to anyone. So it's only one who feels a sense of accountability to Allah, who fears Allah, who seeks to please Allah, such an individual will be able to be just in spite of whatever circumstances arises before himself or herself. And Abu Huraira, he narrated that the Prophet Muhammad said, three, there are three whom Allah will not reject their du'as. There are three groups of people whose du'as, whose, pay, whose uh, supplications will not be rejected by Allah. One who remembers Allah often, 
the oppressed, and the just Imam. These are all in special categories. But at the same time, there are four whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with. As narrated by the Prophet Muhammad the trader who frequently swears by Allah. Everything he sells, he tells you, Wallahi, this is a good product. By Allah, you have the best thing here. Nothing better than it on the market. Such a person is hated by Allah. The proud pauper, the proud pauper, one who is poor, destitute, and instead of being humble, humbled by his state of destitution, he is proud. In spite of it all, he is proud and he is haughty. Such an individual is hated by Allah. Why? Because that is a situation where pride has no place. Pride has no place there. Destitution, poverty is a means of humiliating people, bringing the proud down low to their knees. But such an individual, in spite of it all, still maintains an, an, er an aura of pride. He or she would try to live beyond their means, to create a facade around them that they are living well, they are doing good, you know, they are this, they are that, they are the other. Such a person is hated by Allah. The adulterous old man. The adulterous old man. He didn't just say the adulterer. The adulterous old man. Meaning that a man who has grown old, who knows better, who really has no justification for adultery, not that there can be a justification, but in the sense that a young person driven by hormones, etc., etc., may commit these things because all this pressure is on them. But the old man who doesn't have the pressure anymore, he has no, nothing pushing him and forcing him into adultery, but he still falls into adultery. Such an individual is particularly hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sinful imam the sinful imam imamun ja'ir the leader who is corrupt one who Allah has placed in his hands power control authority and he or she abuses that control such an individual is particularly hated by Allah. The second category, the category of the young man or woman who grows up worshipping Allah. Again, what we're looking at is a circumstance where the pressure is on the most. What we can see when we go and look at all of these categories, people who have the greatest pressure on them to commit evil, to commit sin, these people who restrain themselves in those times, they have the greatest reward. Those who do not have that pressure, but yet go ahead and commit these sins, these people have the greatest punishment. So we see there's a relationship between the reward and the struggle that one has to do to earn it. And this is why the scholars have pointed out a principle which most people find difficult to grasp initially. The idea, as Ibn al-Qayyim had put it, that patience in times of ease is greater or more difficult than patience in times of difficulty. Having patience in times of difficulty is easier 
than having patience in times of ease. How is that? In times of difficulty, the disbeliever can be patient. Men are raised under the principle that men don't cry. So calamity strikes them, they are men. They can hold themselves, they can be patient, don't cry. Or a calamity strikes them and they think logically. What is my reaction going to bring? If I become impatient, I go crazy, I start breaking things around me, what is it going to change? It's not going to change anything. So as a non-believer, not believing in Allah, I can get a hold of myself and be patient. So in this regard, the believer is in no special position over the disbeliever with regards to being patient in times of difficulty. However, being patient in times of ease, only the believer can do this. Only one who believes in Allah can restrain himself or herself from evil in the times of ease. When wealth comes, when one seems to have gained success, the success that this world offers, for the person at that time to control himself or herself and thank Allah, thank God for what he has given them and restrain themselves from squandering the wealth, abusing that wealth, it is only belief in Allah that can restrain that individual at that time. Otherwise, people just let go. When success comes, that's it. Forget God, forget everything. I have succeeded. And it's time to enjoy. This is most difficult. Patience, patience from the Islamic perspective, does not merely mean restraining oneself from doing things it also means restraining oneself from stopping doing things in other words if you are praying regularly when times of success and everything comes to you and you you feel to to be lazy to restrain yourself and to continue to worship Allah. In those times, that is the peak of patience. To stay on the right path, to continue to do what is right at a time when you are successful, this is the greatest difficulty. And this is why all of these cases as we're looking at of individuals who will be shaded by the throne of God on the day of judgment when there will be no shade these are all people who will be driven by circumstances by emotions by hormones by whatever to commit evil sin and to be corrupt so the young man or woman who grows up worshipping Allah, this is a special case. An individual at the time when all the hormones are on them, calling them to corruption, they restrain themselves and instead worship Allah, stay on that path, control themselves and do the right thing. For those who grew up in that state, that is a special reward for them. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith found in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, the two feet of Adam's descendants will not move on the day of resurrection when they stand before Allah until they are asked about five things. One's age and how one spent it. One's youth and how it was used. One's wealth 
and from where it was earned and on what it was spent and what one did with one's knowledge. One's youth and how it was spent. That every person will be asked about their youth. How they spent their youth. Did they spend it in the worship of Allah? Or did they destroy themselves in corruption? And linked to this, in order to protect young people from the trials of the hormones of the teens and the early 20s, Prophet Muhammad said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum ul-ba'a fal yatazawwaj. O young people, those of you who are able to marry, then go ahead and get married. And if you're unable, then fast, because it will cut your desires. Young people are encouraged to marry, to marry young. Unfortunately, in the Muslim world today, Muslims discourage their young people from marrying young. They are told you should finish your education first. You know, and you know, complete your university studies, get your degrees and so on, so then get married. And not only that, they may add, well, for the young men, you better get yourself a house together and get all these other things together. You know, you have everything prepared, then you go and get married. And what it does is it causes many young people to go through the most difficult period of their lives unmarried. And when they finally reach their late 20s or early 30s, this is now the time when they go and get married. So what happened in those almost 20 years between 13 and 30? What happened to them? What happened to them? And whose fault is it? Primarily, it is the fault of the parents. It's the fault of the parents. Of course, they having reached the basis of adulthood in puberty are held responsible for what they do. But the parents carry also a greater sin for having not helped them out of that situation. And furthermore, what we find parents doing, something common here in Toronto, unfortunately, and elsewhere, where a young man comes and wants to marry uh, your daughter and you see he is a pious young man he has good character he has the means to look after your daughter but he is not an Egyptian and you tell him you know I really like you you're a nice guy I, I think you're a good good yeah. but you're not a Somali you know I'm sorry, we only marry our daughters to Somalis. <laughs> what is this an Islam? What has this got to do with Islam? And then we find young girls and young boys involved in corruption here as a result of them having not gotten married. This is a great sin being perpetuated and perpetrated by uh, Muslim families here in this part of the world and elsewhere. And we need to address this issue if we are to try to build wholesome communities which fear Allah. The third category is a man whose heart is attached to the mosque. A man whose heart is attached to the mosque. Meaning that he feels a desire to be in the mosque. He is driven by a desire to be there. When he leaves the masjid, he feels a desire to be back there. Not that he spends all his time in the masjid. This is again a mistaken uh, view where people go overboard. Because Prophet Muhammad came uh, to the masjid on one occasion and saw a man in the masjid. And he came back again and found him in the masjid. He found him in the masjid a number of times. And he asked, who is looking after this man's family? And they said, his brother. And he said, his brother is better than he is. So the idea of just locking oneself down in the masjid like a monk and avoiding one's responsibilities in the world around us, this is not from Islam. This is going to extremes. We have a responsibility, but at the same time, our hearts are attached to the masjid. We want to be there. We are driven 
to, to find uh, a way or a means to be in the masjid. And this, of course, includes women. Uh, though Islam does not require them to go to the masjid, in their homes, they set aside a place to pray. This is their masjid or musalla, the place of prayer. So in the same way, when the time for prayer comes, they find themselves going there to pray. They do not delay on their prayer. This is part of that attachment to the masjid, is praying at the beginning of the prayer time. As Prophet ﷺ had said, أَحَبُّ amal إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الصَّلَاةِ فِي أَوَّلِ وَقْتِهَا The most beloved of deeds to Allah Almighty is prayer at the beginning of its time. So we try to pray whenever this salah comes in. The individual tries to catch the first takbir. Not just pray whenever the salah comes in, meaning you catch the last rak'ah. Right? Or you come to the masjid, you know, and we have what we call a second jama'ah, and a third jama'ah, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, which is not from the sunnah, which the major scholars of Islamic law, the imams, rejected, considered to be not acceptable, but which has become a common practice amongst us today, where you come late to the mosque, you make a new jama'ah. No! The way of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad as described in the books of Athar, إِذَا فَاتَتْهُمُ الْجَمَاعَةَ صَلُّوا فُرَادَةً If they missed the congregational prayer, they prayed individually. So as not to create the idea in the hearts of the believers that congregation is anything you catch. The congregation is the original jama'ah. And it is only in places where there is no established jama'ah, a mos mosque on the roadside, which people just on their way and they travel, they stop off and pray. There you can form different jama'ahs. But where you have a masjid, where there is an imam who has been designated, prayer times have been designated, there is only one jama'ah. Furthermore, Prophet Muhammad had said, لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ مَا فِي الصَّفِّ الْأَوَّلِ مَا كَانَتْ إِلَّا قُرْعَةً If people knew what in terms of value is in the first line of the prayer, people would only get there by drawing lots. But being attached to the masjid means trying to catch that first takbir being in the first line of the prayer. Furthermore, it involves remembering Allah after salah. It also involves uh, going to the masjid for prayers like salat al duha about which Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does it will get the reward of umrah. And it also involves training our children to go to the masjid regularly, to develop a love of the masjid. And I should mention that when we are saying remembering Allah in the masjid, it does not mean, you know, group remembrance where we gather groups together or the imam, he says subhanallah and everybody repeats after him subhanallah because this is not from the sunnah. And when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came into the masjid in Damascus and he found people doing this, he chided them. He spoke out against them. He asked them, what are you doing? Are you changing Allah's religion and the Prophet ﷺ is still warm in his grave? So remembrance of Allah must be in accordance with the methodology taught by Rasulullah ﷺ. It means not doing it in groups. It means not making up our own versions of dhikr, of remembrance of Allah. As some people taught that when you want to remember Allah, you just repeat the name Allah. So you say Allah, 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 Allah. And you just keep repeating that over and over and over again. Or you say, instead of saying Allah, which is Allah who, you just say who. Who, 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 who? And you have people saying, claiming to remember Allah by screaming this. You hear them in their so-called circles of dhikr. It sounds like a bunch of wolves. 
Who, 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 who? Like this is it's madness. And they think that they're remembering Allah. In fact, they're insulting Allah. This, this is an insult to Allah. Just as if somebody were to call you one by your name and keep repeating it, your name over and over again. Muhammad, 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 Muhammad. You look at this person and say, what is wrong with this guy? You know, we need to take him to the hospital. And if instead of calling you Muhammad, he keeps calling you Moo, 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 Moo. You say, hey, what are you doing? My name is Muhammad, not Moo. You know? So similarly, this kind of practice of distorting Allah's names, saying them in ways which were not, uh, were not taught by Prophet Muhammad or like some say, you know, there's one uh, tariqah, which teaches that when you say Allah's name, you're supposed to, you start by looking at your heart, and you say, Allahu. You know? I said, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Did Prophet Muhammad do this? No. We even have those, you know, of the um, Mahlawi order, who stand up and spin themselves around in circles, you know, in circles, like ballerinas, and they say, well, we are remembering Allah. This is remembering Allah. Where? Where? Where did this come from? Surely not from Rasulullah So when we speak about remembering Allah, we speak about remembering Him as He was remembered by Rasulullah as His companions understood the remembrance of Allah. And this also includes dhikr beads. This also includes dhikr beads. Those who remember Allah by counting on these beads. Who started to do this practice many years after the death of Prophet Muhammad Right? He died in the 7th century. If you go to the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, the biggest encyclopedia and most authoritative encyclopedia in English, and you look under rosary, you will find that the Catholics began using dhikr beads back in the tw second century. They began it and they described the dhikr beads of the Catholics and it is the same description of the dhikr beads that Muslims are using today. And truly, when I was studying in Medina, we used to see in the shops that were selling these dhikr beads, the cases in which they came. They came from Italy. These were the specialists in making dhikr beads. And what would be written on the outside of the case? Mohammedan rosaries. Because that's what they were. Mohammedan rosaries. It's not from the sunnah. The sunnah of Rasulullah and his companions was to count the remembrance of Allah on the fingertips. So we don't have any religious artifacts. You see the other religious systems, you see them caught up in a bunch of artifacts. They have different objects which they use in their worship. We don't have objects which we use in our worship. We worship Allah pure without the need for any objects. Even a cap, for example. Some people turn the cap, which is from the sunnah of the Sahaba and the others, natural sunnah to cover their heads. But some people turn it into a prayer cap. Right? So you have some mosques where they have a pile of caps by the door. When you come in, people pick up their caps, stick it on their head, they pray when they finish, they take it off, put it back, and they step out. You know? Or they carry the caps um, in, in their pockets or handkerchiefs. You know, and when the time comes for prayer, they take it out, they tie it in some knots and they put it on their head. Sometimes this handkerchief, they've blown their nose in. And they're sticking it on their head, feeling, you know, I must cover my head at any cost. So, the remembrance of Allah should be as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to remember Him. And the fourth category is that of two men or women who love each other only for the sake of Allah. It is the nature of human beings to love others for what one gets from others. So and so helps me, so and so gives me, I love that person. When they don't give me, I don't love them anymore. Right? 
This is the nature. We tend to love people for what we get from them. Whereas the true love, the higher love, the love which is pleasing to God, which God rewards us for, is to love our brothers and our sisters for the sake of Allah. Only for the sake of Allah. We meet them for the sake of Allah and we separate for the sake of Allah. There are no ulterior motives. There are no ulterior motives. And this means that our brothers and our sisters have a right in our wealth. We help them whenever the opportunity presents itself. And there are a number of rights of brotherhood about which the Prophet ﷺ spoke. And in general, we can say that the rights of brotherhood not only involve the giving of and sharing of what we have, but it also involves the protecting of our brothers and sisters honor. When we love somebody for the sake of Allah, we protect their honor. Meaning that if people are speaking about our brothers and our sisters, we stop them. We do not allow them to backbite, to slander, etc. We're not silent in times when their honor is being destroyed. Also, we are silent about their faults when there is no need to, exp to express their faults. There are certain times, of course, when we will speak and we should speak about the faults of our brothers or sisters. In the times of marriage, for example, somebody comes and wants to marry so-and-so and they ask, well, what do you know about so-and-so? At this time, one cannot say, oh, he's a wonderful Muslim, she's a wonderful Muslim, you know, just say good things. No. If there are things which are wrong, then they should be told. They should be the people should be informed about it. Because this is now a, a, a question of trust and amana, where people are trusting in you to give them the correct information. And this was the methodology of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, when Fatima bin Qais came and asked him about marriage to uh, Abu Sufyan and to Amr ibn al-As, you know, both of these people had proposed to her. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said to, to, to her that Amr ibn al-As, he is known to beat his women. And Abu Sufyan is stingy. He doesn't share his money. So he wandered. And he said, if you really want a good husband, then marry Usama ibn Zaid. He recommended somebody else. Okay? So those circumstances, it is permissible for us to speak about the faults of others. Or in cases where we're going into a business deal. You know, you ask a brother or you ask a sister, you know, I'm, I'm planning to enter into this business deal to make this person a business partner. What do you think? What's your opinion? Now you just finished getting ripped off by this person. You cannot just sit there and say, oh, he's a good brother. Good sister, mashallah, you know, because you don't want to speak bad about the person. No, this is not the time. Because it is your responsibility to protect your brother and sister where they may be harmed by that individual. So there's a time when you must speak. But that doesn't mean you just let loose. You know, you didn't just tell them what you needed to tell them, but you went into everything else. The clothes they wear, you know how they blow their nose, you know, you don't need to go into all the things that you feel you don't like about them, you just deal with the things which have to do with that particular uh, request which was made upon you. So, that second uh, or that fourth group are those who love each other for the sake of Allah. They meet out of the sake of Allah and they separate for the sake of Allah. They advise each other for the sake of Allah. When they see each other doing wrong, they advise each other. They advise each other to be patient and they advise each other to be truthful. Furthermore, they excuse the mistakes of others. They try to have a good thought about their brothers and sisters. And the Prophet had said, Al Mu'min Miratul Mu'min, that a believer is a mirror of his fellow 
believer or her fellow believer. We also, as believers, should make dua for our brothers and sisters in this life as well as after their death. Because Prophet Sallallahu had said, Dua al akh li akhi bi al ghayb la yurad. The supplication of a brother for his brother, of a Muslim for another Muslim, in their absence, will, is not rejected by Allah. And we also give them the benefit of the doubt. Where circumstance appears that they have done something wrong, we try to find some excuse. Maybe we have misunderstood. Maybe they misunderstood. They didn't intend this, as Allah warns us. And as the Prophet ﷺ warned us, warned us also in the Sunnah, you know, when Allah told us, in the dhani ithm, indeed some forms of doubt is sin. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, Iyakum wa dhan, fa inna dhan akdabu al hadith. Beware of doubts. For, for indeed, Speaking about doubts is the worst or the most lying form of speech. And the fifth category is a man who is called by a beautiful and powerful woman, a woman who has both beauty and status, right? Such a man who called by such a woman rejects her, or a woman who is invited by a man who has wealth and has uh, status and is, is handsome or whatever, she rejects him for the fear of Allah, such will be under the throne of Allah on a day when there will be no shade other than the shade of Allah's throne. Because this is the height of temptation. Beauty and status. And we have in Sahih al-Bukhari, a situation where three young men or three men were trapped in a cave. A boulder had come over the mouth of the cave. They had entered the cave seeking protection from rain. And in that state, it seemed as though they would die. So each of them made a dua, calling on Allah, making tawassul, with some righteous deed which they did. And as a result of seeking intercession through their righteous deeds, the boulder was removed from the cave by the mercy of Allah. One of those three was one who was in a position to exploit a woman who was indebted to him, but he restrained himself from doing so when she reminded him to fear Allah. Whenever a male or a female restrains themselves and they're in a position to fulfill their desires, Allah rewards them greatly. As he said through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Man taraka shay'an lillah awwadahu Allahu khayran minhu Whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will reward them with what is better than it. This hadith is one which we need to reflect on, especially in our lives here as we live in a society belonging to the disbelievers. One in which our faith is tested daily. Where we are invited by this society to disobey Allah, whether it is through mortgages or insurance, or a variety of other things. We need to reflect on this hadith. Whoever gives up something for the sake of Allah, 
Allah will replace it with what is better than it. And similarly, that individual who gives up that opportunity, an opportunity to corruption wherein one is only accountable to Allah. There's no one around one to prevent one. And they give it up for the sake of Allah. So great is the reward that they would receive the shade of Allah's throne. The sixth category, one who gives sadaqah in such a way, so secret a way, that his right hand or his left hand is unaware of what his right hand gave. This is a metaphor for secrecy. One's left hand is not aware of what the right hand gave. This is a recommendation. It's not to say this is the only way that we can give charity. Charity can be given openly. Sometimes it is good. Prophet ﷺ encouraged it on certain circumstances to encourage others. You know, when we have a need and we say, who will donate? And somebody there stands up and says, I will donate so and so and so. This is halal, this is acceptable. This is a means of encouraging others. But the danger in those circumstance, circumstances is that one gives seeking the admiration, the admiration of others. That others will praise them, say how generous they are, you know, honor them, etc. You know, respect them because of their willingness to give. This is the danger that that enters into our hearts. But if the need arises, we have to do it anyhow. But this is the danger. When one gives in a circumstance where nobody knows. So under those circumstances where they're calling and some people have to step forward, other people who fear that this will enter their heart, after it is all over, they put the money in a package or they write a check and they put it in an envelope and it is given to the project. Nobody knows who gave it. They only know that the money came. When one gives like that, that earns the person that special reward. Because it is our nature, it is our desire to want to be praised, to want to be thanked. This makes us feel good. And this is why Prophet Muhammad said, Man lam yashkuril nas lam yashkurillah. Whoever doesn't thank people doesn't thank Allah. He prescribed that thanking people is obligatory. We must thank people. Why? Because it is encouragement to them to continue to give. It is our nature that if we give something, we do something for somebody, and they don't thank us, that when the time comes a second time to do something for them, we say, ha, why should we give them? They, they were not thankful. They were not grateful. They were ungrateful. So why should we help them? This is our nature to do this. So Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, taking into account that nature, he required us to thank those who are generous and who help us. But the higher level is to give without seeking any thanks, seeking any reward, to do it purely for the sake of Allah. And this principle, the principle of doing actions or acts of worship in secret is something encouraged throughout the religion. Something encouraged throughout the religion. This is why the Prophet Muhammad had said that Afdalus Salah, Salatul Mar'i, Fi Bayti, Illa Al Maktuba. The best prayers are the prayers of a man in his home. 
with the exception of the compulsory prayers. It is preferable, far better, to do the sunnah, what we call the sunnah or the nawafil, in our homes. Far better to do that than to do it in the masjid. Why? Because doing it at home, the chances of doing it for people to see, far less. But we do it, it is sincere. Secondly, it also encourages the members of the household to establish the prayers in the home. That the children sees their parents praying all the time in the home. It is also further encouragement. And also the prayer at night. Tahajjud. The reward for it is great. Why? Because it's again, a person wakes up from his or her sleep and turns to worship Allah. No one knows that they're doing so except Allah. So the reward for such worship is immense. And the last category, one who remembers Allah in private and his or her eyes become filled with tears. Their eyes become filled with tears. Either because when they remember Allah and they reflect on the greatness of Allah, they are moved to tears. It is so great. Allah is so great. Like people, when we watch a football game or some other game that we are addicted to, and our side wins, we're so happy, we're crying with happiness. We do that, but we can't cry with happiness when reflecting on Allah. This is telling us we're in a state. It's telling us we are in a state. Or we cry when reflecting on our sins. What we have done, how disobedient we have been, the fact that Allah knows everything that we have done and we will see it on the day of judgment. So we cry out of regret, out of sadness, out of knowing that Allah is aware of everything and He will bring us to account. Instead of crying Remembering Allah in this way, we cry when our team loses. When our favorite team loses, we thought they were going to win the championship. And at the last moment, the other team defeated them. And we are so sad, we are driven to tears. We cry for the wrong things. And it's a reflection of the state of our Iman. We don't look into ourselves and realize our position before Allah. We don't feel ashamed of our disobedience. This is when we should be crying. As the Prophet Muhammad had said in an authentic narration, we should cry before Allah. And if we cannot cry, we should make ourselves cry. We should make ourselves cry. Somebody might say, well, that's like hypocrisy. You're crying when you really don't have the necessary sadness or whatever to cry, but no. We cry, we make ourselves cry in order to break the hardness of our hearts. We are forcing ourselves to cry. That perhaps having done that enough times, we will cry when we should cry. And of course this crying is not a public crying. 
like the 27th of Ramadan, when people think it's Laylatul Qadr, and the Imam is making the Qunut, and people are wailing and crying, and all this is carrying on. This is not from the Sunnah. This is not the crying which is pleasing to Allah. The crying which is pleasing to Allah is the one which comes spontaneously. The one which comes in private. If it comes on us spontaneously because we cannot control it, it's one thing. But this crying, this, this artificial wailing on that particular night, no. This is not from the Sunnah. This is not what Allah has called us to do. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man ذكر الله ففاضت عيناه من خشية الله حتى يصيب الأرض من دموعه لم يعذب يوم القيامة." One who remembers Allah and his or her eyes become filled with tears from the fear of Allah. So much so that the earth becomes wet from their tears. They will not be punished on the day of judgment. So many places in the Quran where Allah speaks about the true believers as being those who when Allah's verses are recited to them, recited to them, wajilat kulubuhum, their hearts become soft. This is among the things that we have to fight against. The hardness of the hearts. Where we are not moved to tears, where we don't feel in our hearts, our hearts don't quiver when Allah's name is mentioned. When the Quran is recited, we are not touched by it because we don't reflect on its meanings. As Allah says to us, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they not reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an? Or are their hearts sealed up? We are not reflecting on what Allah is saying. What we end up liking or preferring is the musical quality of the various reciters. We like Abdul Basit over, you know, Al Husri, or you like Minshawi over this one. Why? Because you like the beauty of their voices. So we have turned the Quranic recitation into a love like those who love the pop stars. This is something we need to reflect on. The Quran is supposed to move us not because of the beauty of the reciter's voice, but because of what Allah is saying. This is why we need to know Arabic. We need to understand Allah's words as they were revealed. This is a duty on each and every Muslim to strive to learn Arabic to the degree that he or she is able. So when they hear Allah's words recited, it moves them. It touches their hearts. So in summary, there are seven. Seven shaded by the shade of Allah's throne on a day when there is no shade. Allah's throne is above His creation. And Allah is above His throne. He is beyond, above and beyond the creation. He is not mixed up inside of His creation. A very important concept. Because the belief that Allah is everywhere, inside of everything, this is the foundation of idolatry. Those who worship idols, who have philosophized their worship, will tell you, I am not worshiping this idol that you see. 
Ganesh, the elephant head god of the Hindus. I am not worshipping this object that you see. I am worshipping Brahman. The one God who is everywhere and who pervades everything. But at the time of my worship of this idol that you see, that God Brahman becomes concentrated in the idol. So I'm worshipping Brahman who is concentrated in the idol and not the idol. That is what they say. Those who have delved into the religion, who know the depths of it, this is their argument. Of course, the common Hindu, if you ask him, he says, I worship Ganesh because whenever I worship him, my prayers are answered. Yeah, it's the idol. I don't have a problem with that. When I pray to Ganesh, what I pray for, my prayers are answered. That's his answer. He doesn't go into philosophy. But those who are more educated, the yogis, their sheikhs, the sheikhs will give you this explanation of the, the essence of their worship. So when one says Allah is everywhere, one supports their idolatry. One supports and promotes the idea that Allah is mixed up inside of His creation. And that leads ultimately to the claim that Allah and His creation are one. What is known as Wahdatil Wujud or monism. This is an idea which was propagated by Ibn Arabi, Al-Andalusi, from the 13th century, who made this claim. Everything, why are you worshipping anyone outside of yourself? Allah is in me, Allah is in you. There's no need to worship any external being. You can worship yourself, because you are Allah. This idea is being promoted today by Harun Yahya. Harun Yahya, books coming out of Turkey, Evolution, Deceit, Perish Nations, etc., etc. If you go to the end of the book, the last chapter, his last chapter is exactly that. He says, those stupid people who think that Allah is above his creation. He ridicules those who believe that Allah is above his creation. Though when you go to Sahih Muslim, to the hadith of Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam, who had slapped his slave girl in the face because some of the sheep that she was guarding were stolen by a wolf. And he went to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to find out what he could do as atonement for this evil deed which he had done, slapping her in the face. And the Prophet ﷺ told him to bring her. He asked, can I free her? He said, bring her. And when he brought her, he asked her, Ain Allah, where is Allah? And she said, Fis sama, above the heavens. And he said, Wa man ana, and who am I? And she said, Anta Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. And he turned to Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam and said to him, A'tiqha fa innaha mu'mina. Free her because she is a true believer. Prophet Muhammad confirmed her statement that Allah is above the heavens as proof of the correctness of her faith. But Harun Yahya says, those stupid people who think that Allah is above the heavens. He goes on to say Allah is everywhere. This world that you see is an illusion. And he brings the scientific arguments about why this world is an illusion. Because yes, on the molecular level, this table, this, this podium, which looks solid to us, it feels solid. If you go down on the molecular level, everything is moving. It is not solid. And if you look at colors, the colors that we see, are these colors real? Or is it the reflection of, of the light on these objects as it hits our retina and our brains uh, create a sense of color in our brain? 
So he argues, it is all an illusion. This world is a shadow world. This is, he's taken from Plato. Plato speaks about the shadow world, you know, ancient Greek philosophers. And he argues that this world is an illusion. And he quotes from Ibn Arabi and praises him as the Imam Rabbani when he was in fact a kafir, a disbeliever, a heretic who even many of those who are involved in Sufism, big figures amongst the Sufis declared him to be a heretic. But who claims for himself to be the Khatamul Awliya, the seal of the sainthood? And they're ignorant Muslims who take him as such and pray to him. The point is, beware of Harun Yahya. His books have information which does uh, defeat the arguments of the evolutionists. He brings some good bits and pieces of information. However, he has a hidden agenda. He has a hidden agenda. Beware of Harun Yahya. So these seven individuals who represent groups of people who are shaded by Allah's throne on the day when there's no shade, the righteous Imam, the just Imam, the leader, the ruler who is just, who is just from himself, not out of fear of anybody, not out of ulterior motives, but out of the fear of Allah. And he creates a society where young people can grow up worshipping Allah. And one who grows up worshipping Allah will be shaded by the throne. And those who grow up worshipping Allah will have their hearts attached to the mosques. The third category, those whose hearts are attached to the mosques. And those whose hearts are attached to the mosques, coming in contact with the other believers, joining them in prayer on a regular basis, they develop amongst themselves a love of each other for the sake of Allah. It is their fear of Allah, their love of Allah, which has brought them there. So they develop relationships out of fear and love of Allah. And those who have developed that fear, when they are invited, to corruption by those in power and with beauty and who are handsome, etc., they are able to stand firm and say, Inni akhaf Allah. Indeed, I fear Allah. I will not do as you request. And those who have that strength, that strength of Iman, that strength of character, such a person is able to give without seeking praise. They give from their wealth, their time, their strength, without seeking a reward. They're doing it only for the sake of Allah. And those who have that ability, who don't need the praise of others, when they remember Allah, their hearts, their eyes, become filled with tears. Their hearts become soft and their eyes become filled with tears. I ask Allah to make us of those who will be shaded by Allah's throne on the day when there's no shade. However, we know that this is not easy. This is something that we have to work for. It involves striving against our desires. All of our desires are pushing us to be the opposite of all of this. The opposite. So we have to struggle. We have to fight. And that's this life. A life of test and trial. I pray Allah give us the strength to meet the tests. And to fulfill our role here in this life. And to earn for ourselves paradise in the next. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I hope that you keep me in your prayers as I keep you in mine. Subhanakallahumma.